Hello everyone, uh, my name is Darius Washington, I'm Momocon's Anime Industry Coordinator, and I'm here to bring you uh, an awesome pair of people who are doing a book about one of the greatest uh, creators of anime ever, uh, Leiji Matsumoto. And uh, with me, I have the authors of that book. Uh, please introduce yourselves. Helen? Hi, I'm Helen McCarthy, and I'm both one of the eight authors of this book and one of the two editors. It's very, very much a, a collective effort uh, because Matsumoto is so huge. It would be really difficult for one person to do justice to every side of his creativity in a book. And if each of the eight of us had written a book, we'd have eight very different books, which would be great. But we'd also wait a long time for some of them. So it just seemed like a great idea to bring everybody together. Awesome. And Tim? My name is Tim Eldred, and I've been an anime fan ever since uh, the Speed Racer days. And um, the very next thing that came along and grabbed me was Star Blazers, which began in Japan as Space Battleship Yamato. And of course, we all know, at least most of us know, that Leiji Matsumoto was the creative director on that show. And so, um, my love for that show gave me a love for his art and his other works. Um, so I followed them for years and years ever since. And uh, at one point I actually got to interview him live at his home. Um, I'm not a publisher on the book, I'm a contributor, but I was one of the first people that Helen invited on board. So I'm very grateful for the chance to uh, throw in. Awesome. Actually, Tim was just reminding me what I should have said, because I just started talking straight about the about the book, of course, because mm -hmm. the book is just so exciting and I'm thrilled to be part of it. But I've been researching anime since 1981, when I met my first manga, actually, which was um, Gornagai's Devilman in a Spanish translation. Oh, and wow. I met him because of the guy behind me in my picture, Steve Kite, because he just got back from a holiday in Mallorca, which is part of Spain. And in Spain, generally, and in France, they've had anime on TV since the mid-70s. So uh, way ahead of us for most things. We had, um, we had Marine Boy in 66, I think, on the BBC, and you guys had, as you say, Speed Racer. But Europe was up there. And when Steve came back and showed me this wonderful Japanese stuff and told me that there were cartoons relating to it as well, I just got excited and I wanted to find out more. And from that has come my whole career. And the best thing about it really has been the chance to meet people like Tim and people like my co-editor, Dr. Darren John Ashmore, who's professor of anthropology at um, Yamanashi Gakuin University in Kofu, about two and a half hours outside Tokyo. and. To work on things like this is just thrilling because you imagine you get you've got this terrific sandbox. You have an amazing guy, Matsumoto, whose work is so fantastic. He's never had a book about him in English before. So that's a sandbox to start with. But then you get to invite some of the cleverest people you know who also love like Matsumoto to come in and play with you. So that's that's a great project. Awesome. Awesome. Um, so I want to get a small bit of background on, on, on both, both of you for, for, for uh, readers here. Uh, Helen, uh, so you, uh, you've you been pu publishing uh, stuff like, like magazines and books for, for a bit. Uh, just, tell, just tell a little bit about that. A little while, yeah. Um, I wanted a book on anime and manga when Steve introduced me to it in 1981. And there wasn't one, there was nothing written in English. There were a few lines in, you know, those big encyclopedias of animation that you get in libraries. And they said things like Japanese animation, Saturday morning, Kiddie Drek, except for this guy Tezuka, he does some art house occasionally that's worth looking at. And that was it. The whole of Japanese animation dismissed in three lines. Manga was pretty much the same. Nobody knew what manga was. And I thought there has to be a book to tell people about this stuff because it's great. Now in 1983, just after I started researching, Frederick Shout did us all the huge favor of writing Manga Manga, the world of Japanese comics and publishing it through Kodansha. So I thought, well, thank God, I've now only got to think about how to get somebody to publish on anime. And it took me 12 years of researching, writing, realizing I knew nothing, finding a few people who knew a bit more, knocking on doors, talking to people, you know, just the works. And, and that was my first decade of, of, of fandom 
was just an uphill struggle to try and get anything published. And gradually I began to get little articles here and there in, in literary magazines, science fiction magazines, fandom magazines, geek stuff basically. And a few things in, in newspapers and so on. And then I got the opportunity to found my own anime magazine, which was Anime UK, that was 91. And at that point we had a real bit of luck in that Akira hit British screens in 1990, 91. And of course that brought a wave of attention and the only people that knew anything about anime and manga were basically fans, you know, people like Tim and I. So all of a sudden the press were on the phone to us and one of the people who had not even taken my meeting when I tried to pitch a book called me and said this is the right time to do that book, shall we do it? So I took, I took things from there and so as a result of that I've been, let's see, 1991 I started publishing the magazine. We're in 2020 now, so very nearly 30 years of um, publishing on, on Japanese animation, Japanese popular culture, which has been a hell of a ride and an absolute privilege the whole way. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Tim, please as well. Well, Helen took a more academic route to where she is now than I did. Um, I was always a, uh, a smaller scale guy. And so my uh, anime publishing adventures were all contained in uh, the pages of fanzines and apps and things like that. Um, over time, I did uh, a lot of projects for uh, the fan community based on my favorite shows. Uh, one of the largest was uh, a complete guide to a uh, sunrise anime that I loved called Armored Trooper Votums. Mm. And um, as an artist with a commercial art uh, background, um, I, I early on developed skills in um, publishing and packaging and graphic design. And so these two things just naturally merged together. And so that, uh, that Votum's guide turned into one of the, um, the larger and more professionally produced fanzine projects of the 80s and it caught a lot of attention and ultimately resulted in the show itself being imported to the West. Um, so I was very proud that uh, what began as a purely uh, self-entertaining effort ended up delivering a show to the audience that was waiting for it. Um, other than that, I had a fan club that I did a regular newsletter for and uh, ultimately, I hooked up with the company that owns the, or rather owned, past tense, the American Rights for Star Blazers, and was able to uh, produce a comic book series for them, which eventually evolved into work on their DVD line, and ultimately a website called starblazers.com, which has evolved into my own Yamato fan site called Cosmo DNA and it's now at ourstarblazers.com and I've been working on that since 2002 so 18 years yeah. and it's the single largest resource anywhere in the world for that particular uh, series uh, and that work is ongoing uh, I, I don't think I'll ever get tired of it <laughs> I don't think you'll ever finish it either because there is just so much on Matsumoto that was published in. I'm astonished at the stuff you got from 80s fanzines, 70s fanzines, Japanese publications in the 80s. And there's so much of that stuff that you, you will probably be sitting here, please God, we'll all be sitting here in 50 years time. Hopefully by then out of coronavirus lockdown, but finding <laughs> you've still got stuff that you've discovered that needs to be translated. Oh yeah, and uh, in terms of a uh, sort of index to the entire evolution of manga and anime, uh, Yamato is a terrific subject because it it was there at a pivotal time and it created all of the trends that we still live with today. And so uh, even if the show itself is not your favorite, um, it, it's, it, uh, it is index linked to almost everything else that's happened. And so um, I, uh, I enjoy the idea that I'm creating a resource for the medium itself, you know, refracted through one particular franchise, but still 
related to everything. I think that's quite important because a lot of people don't realize, particularly, you know, when you're a young fan and you put on your, your screen or whatever for the first time and you see a show that really grabs you, whatever it is, Dragon Ball, One Piece, Pokemon, for you, that show is it. That show is shining perfection, the greatest thing ever. Nothing has ever equaled it. But of course, as you get older and you see more shows, you realize that that show is part of a continuum and that it shares a lot of characteristics with shows that went before and shows that came after. And I think something like Cosmo DNA puts Yamato in that context and makes a really easy access point because of course, even now, when so many more people speak a bit of Japanese and quite a few people speak a lot of Japanese, still researching your favorite show and finding that it's all in a language where you can't even recognize the characters is daunting for most fans. But it's, so it's great to have an, an access point in your language that you can relate to. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to ask you very, very briefly, did you find it, find it hard to start in your respective industries, like your, your, your publishing books? And Tim, uh, you uh, by trade, you are also an animator. Um, did you find it hard to start in your respective industries real quick? Um, it depends what you mean by hard. Uh, I mean, <laughs> no, I I mean one, one of the things that is most annoying about me, according to my dearly beloved and all my siblings, is that if you tell me something cannot be done, I will never give up until I have found a way to do it. And that was it for me with publishing. So many people said, you're never going to break into publishing or media of any kind, talking about these stupid Japanese cartoons that nobody cares about in a language that nobody can understand, that are violent and pornographic, and they're just not very British. You're never, you're never going to do that. Um, and for 12 years, they were right. And from there on, they became wrong. So that it was really, really, really hard. I was working a full time job at the time. And so I was writing, doing my research, making the contacts I needed, going around trying to sell my work, trying to get meetings on holiday time and after hours and so on. And it was very, very, very tough. We didn't have very much money. Luckily, I was in London. I mean, in those days, now with the Internet, it's still not easy, but it's easier. But in those days, the only place you got anything published was London, unless you were doing small local circulation, local newspapers. So if I hadn't actually lived in London, it would have been a lot harder, but it was, it was hard looking back on it at the time. It was just, well, I'm going to show you that you are absolutely wrong about how I'll never get published on this. I'm going to do this thing here. So it wasn't that hard and it was fun. And we met great people and we corresponded with great people and we just had a whale of a time. Yeah. Tim, uh, could you talk about your start a bit? Uh, well, let's see. Um, my fan activities and my uh, anime related writing has always been nonprofit and has always been a respite from professional life, uh, which involves first uh, a long series of jobs in commercial art and graphic design, and then a comic book career, which evolved into a career in uh, TV animation, and that's where I still am. Uh, I'm a, an animation director at Marvel and have been since 2012. Um, and so, Everything that I do related to Yamato and anime and manga is still a hobby. Okay. And I can I consider myself lucky to have it as a as an outlet for the creative juices that don't get uh, called upon uh, at my day job. And uh, I also still make comics too. These days it's web comics, but uh, it's still a very active and and uh, very enjoyable part of what I do. Everything is a break from something else. And so if I'm close to burnout on one project, I can always step over to another one and, um, and get uh, rejuvenated that way. Uh, I would, sing, I would th say the only difficult part of getting into my animation career was just being in the right place at the right time. Um, of course, that's not something you can anticipate. It's mostly a matter of luck. Um, 
but there too, uh, I found that all of my other pursuits informed what I was doing uh, in my animation career. One yeah. of the most interesting things about it was that uh, at the time I entered in the mid to late 90s, uh, the generation of TV producers, the, the people making the decisions about what got on TV, were still uncomfortable with anime, didn't really know what it represented. Uh, they could they could understand that it was a movement, but they were not part of that movement, and so they were still somewhat resistant to it. Um, meanwhile, I'm hunkered down with a whole bunch of other artists who are about my age and have grown up on the same stuff, and we loved everything about it. And we made it our, our duty to inject as much of that anime energy into our work as we possibly could. Um, but still, anytime we tried something that was just a little bit over the line, that was uh, very culturally Japanese anime, we would almost always get pushback from our higher ups who didn't understand what it was. Um, as I said, that was the mid to late 90s. Ten years later, that had all completely changed because that generation of producer uh, had either moved on or had become more educated and knew what we were going for. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, the movement that we all enjoyed had greatly expanded because of anime being imported. Mm -hmm. And so the audience was now on our side. And so um, some of those who were resistant back in the 90s had finally come to realize, oh, this is what the audience wants. And this is what our artists are producing. So all I have to do is let them do what they want. And then uh, it uh, it became much easier. So um, I'd like to uh, start off, let's uh, get to uh, talking about uh, Mr. Matsumoto himself. Um, could you talk about a bit, uh, he's known as the creator, not only of y Yamato, but of uh, this expanding uh, universe with uh, Captain Harlock and uh, Galaxy Express 999, stuff like that. Um, I, I would like to know, uh, I, I, you guys are obviously fans of that particular work, or or some other work so, that he may have done. Um, could you say? Could you tell us, a, um, why do you think it, to a degree, Matsumoto? I think it hasn't quite caught on, like a lot of the lot of the more recent uh, styles of anime. Uh, do you think? Why do you think that he hasn't quite caught on? Why do you think he's like not had a book, for example? About well, the, about I think I think this is this is something in terms of style that Kim, Kim could speak to you better than I can. But to me, it's always seemed that with anime, with most anime from the mid seventies, and most manga from the sixties and seventies, a lot of the styles haven't resonated with Western fans. Uh, with, sorry, I should say with with English and American fans, because of course in Europe where there's a hugely diverse range of, of different styles of cartooning. Many of Matsumoto's manga panels um, don't look that different from some of the Italian and French comic book creators that you can see there. But I think for, certainly from when we came in, in the 80s, 90s, what we were looking at was very, very different to everything that we would see elsewhere in American or British animation and comics. Matsumoto was a real standout. The generation now that are doing animation, more than manga, I think, but there's a look to anime now that has influenced so many people in the West that that's what we expect cartoons to look like. But Matsumoto still doesn't always look like that. And of course, he has very, very little input now on the actual physical making of the comic books and the cartoons that are set in his universe. So he's defined the concepts, he just designed the characters, he designed the craft, but he's not actually hands on making them. And a lot of the younger animators and younger manga makers are <coughs> moving things more in the direction that their generation works with. They're still giving us Matsumoto, but they're giving us their generation's filter on Matsumoto. And I think that it's the very Matsumoto-ness, as it were, if there is a word, and Tim talks about this in his, his article on the book very, very well, 
the things that make Matsumoto Matsumoto as an artist are not things that play so well in the contemporary Western anime market. While to me, the things that make Matsumoto Matsumoto as a story constructor, a legend constructor, a world constructor, are things that play very, very well indeed. But, you know, obviously Tim will have a totally different perspective on that as an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, the way I look at it, um, the anime and manga culture is a moving train. And we all get on that train at different times. Uh, I got on in the early 80s, around the same time Helen did. And um, whatever is happening at that time is what you are, is either what draws you onto that train or what you are exposed to when you step on board and you look around and you become aware of some of the cars that have already gone by. Um, by contrast, if you were to step on that train during the 90s or say the, the 2000s, um, your exposure is going to be completely different. Um, some of the things you see will be influenced by older works, but until you become familiar with those works, you don't really understand what those elements are. Um, now, even in Japan, Matsumoto is somewhat of an anachronism because uh, he was on that train in the late 50s and early 60s, and he was a trendsetter during the 70s, uh, but those trends moved on, and he, he really didn't. Um, however, some of the people who worked with him and were influenced by him did move on and are still working today. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the challenges of boarding that train is be, is not losing the awareness that there are cars uh, behind you that are worth exploring. And the farther back you go, uh, the more you will learn about what it is that you like now, what, what drew you onto the car that you boarded. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that... that um, those who are willing to do that exploration are sort of self-selected. Uh, there is so much material to absorb right now. You never need to travel backward on that train. You never need to look at those older cars uh, to find something that engages you. Uh, and that's truer every year as the amount of anime that gets produced goes up and you know, increases and is influenced by a wider range of things. Um, but inevitably, there's going to be a point where you are either caught up or there's nothing contemporary that still grabs you in the same way. And so then you begin to move backward and explore how you got here. And inevitably, you're going to find something that was influenced by Osama Tezuka or uh, uh, Leiji Matsumoto or uh, Go Nagai or, or any of those progenitors from the, the 60s and the early 70s. Mm -hmm. um, so one of our pro one of our jobs in the in the writing of the book was to find the Matsumoto car on that train and just wallow in it and uh, bring everybody the benefit of that uh, that broad view what came before, what came after. A long time ago, uh, space opera was more popular, science fiction was more popular than it is now. Now it seems it's all shonen, uh, martial arts, or uh, isekai, or, um, or slice of life, uh, and everything. And just, just out of curiosity, do you think we'll ever get to a point where people will come to appreciate uh, space opera as he's become known very much for doing? Well, you, ha you have to remember that space opera was virtually dead all over the world until George Lucas brought out Star Wars. Mm. Um, and suddenly, I mean, one, one, of, one of the reasons why so many uh, people of that era got an opportunity, um, Haruka Takachiho, who did The Dirty Pair, uh, was told you will never sell a space opera. And suddenly there was Star Wars and suddenly he could sell his books. Um, Everything in, in, in science fiction and, and fantasy, and every, everything in nerddom goes in cycles, just like everything in the modern world. 
Um, in romance, for example, at the moment, there's the, the perennial debate going on over Jane Austen. Um, writers of romantic fiction all have to contend with Austen. It doesn't matter if you like her or you loathe her or you think she's pernicious. She is the great monolith with which all writers of, of romantic fiction have to contend. And there are periods when Austen type romances are out of fashion and periods where they're in and they come around in cycles and in just the same way in all forms of science fiction and fantasy. There are periods when somebody says, we really need a huge, great swashbuckling legend about a lone hero who will take on the might of evil and conquer it. And there are periods when people are like, no, nah, we we'll just have something about four schoolgirls in a little school in a small town in Japan not doing very much. It's, it's a case of riding those waves. And I think having seen how anime has transitioned and the phases it's gone through over now nearly 40 years, I think we, 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 can, we can be a bit patient and wait for space opera to come back. It'll come back in our lifetimes, don't worry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things to keep in mind about space opera and any other genre is that it's representative of its time and the, the forces that are at play, the social forces that are concerning you um, at any given time. One of the things that made space opera uh, popular in the 70s was global conditions in which Japan and many other countries felt like uh, forces were influencing them that were beyond anyone's control. Um, one particular uh, nexus point from the 70s was the oil shock of, I think, 1972, 1973, yeah. which uh, threw the entire global economy out of balance. And suddenly, uh, people in Japan felt like they were just cogs in some giant, vast machine that they would never uh, understand. And so one of the things that came along during that time was the original space battleship Yamato which was all about uh, Earth being overwhelmed by these forces that were beyond understanding. Uh, and uh, the world was facing uh, horrendous change. And so that show was created as a response to those conditions. A few years later, uh, George Lucas kind of did the same, but his response was slightly different. Uh, it was motivated by economic issues, but also uh, like government corruption and ongoing wars and things like that. And so uh, he made his story uh, into a counter uh, to all of that. Here's an, I don't want to use the word escape because it wasn't really escape. It was cleverer than that. It was a symbol of how individuals still had influence. And uh, Yamato played off the same tropes. Um, and then Matsumoto went on to create Captain Harlock and Galaxy Express and uh, Queen Millennia and many, many other spin-offs from those. And all of them had the same theme, which was the everyman facing larger uh, threats and uh, having to confront uh, major movements in society and culture. Mm -hmm. Those were prevalent in the 70s. The 70s were very, very turbulent. Uh, I, I kind of think we're in those times again now. And so as the overwhelming threats get larger and larger and larger, the stories we create become more and more responsive. Uh, I think one of the reasons that we saw a, such a big wave in anime of what we call slice of life stories is that uh, for a time, those larger forces seem to be either at bay or not as, uh, as threatening as they are right now. And so we may be at the point because of uh, the global economy and uh, the wealth gap and the uh, pandemic that the time is coming again for these stories of individuals facing down mega threats. Um, it, I, I, it's no coincidence that Space Battleship Yamato is back in the form of various reboots and is doing very well. 
mm-hmm. and is continuing. Um, and there are plenty of other Matsumoto stories that can fill that void. So if the demand is there, we may find people uh, rediscovering Captain Harlock and Galaxy Express and, and some of those other things. If I if I remember correctly, they're supposed to be doing um, three films of uh, Harlock, Amaraldus, and uh, Galaxy Express, uh, all produced by Gainax, if I remember correctly. Uh, I haven't heard anything about that. Um, yeah, there have been perennial Matsumoto projects always in development and always being shelved. And so I wouldn't take any uh, current announcements very seriously until you see actual commitment to a timetable for production. Okay. Um, but there was a, uh, a CG Captain Harlock movie uh, a few years ago. Ah, uh, Shinji Aramaki, yes. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't perfect, but it's still worth a look. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't think it's going to be much longer before we see somebody dip into that well again. Again, it always depends on prevailing social forces and um, the work of artists and writers to respond to them. That's something that goes back all the way to the beginning of our history. And in fact, that that's where all of this came from, because Matsumoto, of course, was born into a period of enormous political and social change in mm-hmm. Japan. Um, and he saw within his own family those forces change his family situation from being a very comfortable, very well-to-do, very respected professional samurai descended family. His dad was a test pilot, um, which was a pretty well paid job. And from from that, of course, he was drafted. Um, He worked training young pilots and he was so devastated by the losses of the young men he trained because the attrition in all air forces in in World War II was horrendous, uh, that he just could not go back to flying. After the war, he was offered several very comfortable jobs with Japan's national airlines and with various other air air industry interests, and he couldn't take them. Hmm. He just could not face it. So Matsumoto went from a very affluent early childhood to a really desperately poor post-war period. And that upheaval and his father's reaction to it, which was to say, I am the same person I always was. I live by my principles, regardless of whether that brings me good things or bad things. That's what I do because I'm a man. Matsumoto, that made such a deep impression on Matsumoto that that changed the way he thought about or molded the way he thought about men and what's required of men and what's required of heroes and what's required of society for the rest of his life. So essentially, what he's doing is, as, as Tim said, responding to situations, but responding to the situations he was born into, which is all any artist can do, as well as to the various situations that now other artists see in his work and think, I get that, you know, I see where he's coming from. Because those situations, sadly, while we have the political and economic situation we have in the world, those situations will go on arising. While it's more profitable for large corporations and governments to exploit people than to nurture them as resources, we will carry on having reason to to look for Luke Skywalker or Captain Harlock or whoever it is we're looking for. Yeah. Um, see, in in uh, in hearing that initial bit about his dad and the philosophy, that pretty much does explain you know Harlock and Moraldus. And I also, um, uh, people who not, may or not have seen the cockpit, um, the, his depiction of World War II, things like that. It, it, it's, that puts everything into perspective just now. Um, something else that is uh, talking specifically about Captain Harlock, um, something else that comes to bear is that the original Captain Harlock manga, which was finally imported to America a, a year or two years ago, uh, is somewhat peculiar, I will say. Uh, it takes a while to get used to the art style. And um, I would not say that the writing of that particular manga was Matsumoto's best. 
um, that was done at a time when he was uh, he was also doing Galaxy Express. They were contemporary. He was uh, creating both manga simultaneously, and so I think his focus was divided in some cases. So the the storytelling in Captain Harlock was is not as refined as some of his other works, um, and I think he was probably a little more engaged in Galaxy Express at the time because the writing is more personal. Uh, you can tell it comes from his own experience much in, in, in much more um, depth. Uh, you can tell that the boy in Galaxy Express is Matsumoto himself, confronting a lot of the same things and the same conditions that he confronted as a child. Um, However, uh, going back to Harlock again, we do have a lot of anime to look at. And it's it, the character has been interpreted in a number of different ways by a number of different creators. And so I think there is still plenty of opportunity for that character to thrive. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, uh, the latest uh, Captain Harlock manga, which was created by a completely different artist, uh, I think is much more interesting and much more engaging than the original was and i think it's because we now have the benefit of the matsumoto uh milieu combined with something a little more modern and a little more focused yes. and so uh again it's a it's a fascinating entry point if you can uh if you can find a version of captain harlock that appeals to you there are, you know, a dozen other versions immediately accessible, mm, yeah. and uh, it's a train unto itself. <laughs> yes. It's, it's, so, well, see, maybe Matsumoto is 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 part of not so much an anime train as an anime network. <laughs> and uh, sure. they all start out from Tokyo Central, and they all shoot off to strange places. <laughs> um. I, I, oh, then my life. Your cat has woken up, Tim. Sorry. That distracted me. Look, a squirrel. Oh, oh that was my phone going off. Um, oh, he's, he's behind you, and when your phone went off, he or she? Well, I don't have a cat here. I have a puppy. A male. Oh, your puppy. Yeah. Your, your, he lifted his head when your phone went off, and then lay oh. down again. Went back to sleep. He's so sweet. Oh, <laughs> Let's introduce him to the folks, shall we? Hello. This is Cosmo. Hello, Hello Cosmo. Hello, Cosmo. How are you doing? He was not named by me, by the way. Oh, wow. <laughs> Cosmo is a, uh, is a Matsumoto word, for sure. Oh, he's so sweet. How old is he? He's four months. Oh, wow. Yep. Oh. He's my lockdown buddy. Yes. And now you have company on your walks, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Very, yeah. very, very cool. Yay. All right, back to your nap. Matsumoto was a cat person. And all the iterations of Meekhood are one of his lovely minor threads in manga. He's, he's done so much great work on cats. And I think for, for his cat work alone, which remains a very minor part of his canon, but he deserves to be celebrated. Sure. <laughs> one of the things that gets lost in, um, in uh, this subject is that uh, Matsumoto was by no means limited to space opera or science fiction. Mm -hmm. he's, uh, he's dabbled in just about every genre. Uh, his first entry point into the world of manga was uh, girls romance comics. Mm. 15 years. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And some really remarkable stories there. Mm -hmm. And at the time, uh, he was still developing as an artist and he was obviously much more influenced by Osama Tezuka um, to the point where he, he, their works were almost indistinguishable to the average viewer. Um, so it's interesting to go back to the 60s and watch him evolve not only from one genre to another but to evolve from one art style to another so by the end of that decade uh, his work bore almost no resemblance to where he began but mm -hmm. during that time uh, he dabbled in comedy and um, westerns and war stories and just about everything um, he reminds me a lot of jack kirby in that uh, out of necessity, Kirby had to jump from one genre to another uh, just to survive. And yeah. it may have been exactly the same way for a young Matsumoto. Okay. 
Um, I definitely want to, add to, to uh, uh, jump to the book here. Um, how did you guys, uh, how exactly did it come about? Uh, how did you divide uh, who was going to write what? In fact, who are the different people that uh, actually got to contribute to this? And uh, also, which one of you ta- uh, got to do uh, a segment on Daft Punk? Well, how exactly it came about is something that I am not at liberty to reveal because oh, okay. there are a couple of iterations of this book where um, legal action has been necessary. I see. Okay. <laughs> well, legal, legal action has been has been possible, and therefore there are some things I can't talk about. But essentially, um, this whole project was conceived by Darren Ashmore. I've known Darren since he was sixteen since long before he became a professor of anthropology at a Japanese university. Um, And in fact, Darren was one of the crew that mounted the first British anime, the first British con devoted solely to anime, which was Anime Day 91, back in 1991. Um, But Darren had wanted to do this book for a long time because like Tim, he's he's met Matsumoto, he he adores his work. Uh, He finds particular meaning in its connections with the universe of Wagner and and with Norse mythology and he's written on that for the book but he wanted to do this book and and in Japanese as American universities you have to publish you're expected to publish and this was in his pre-tenure days so he put the book together packaged it it met with a couple of mishaps but we were determined to keep it going so he came along to me and said would you help me with this um, and co-edit it with me because it will take some driving. Um, And one of the things that I am happiest about, although not surprised about, is Darren thought that because it had had a slightly checkered history in Japan, uh, for for no fault of the project or the university, it was just that they'd been let down on two instances, it would not sell. Um, I started making calls and sending out emails and on, partly on, on Matsumoto's name, because it was unknown, I sold it in three weeks. Um, and I think the fact that Matsumoto was unknown and the fact that we were able to say to, to American and British publishers, look, here is this guy, this is his CV. He's practically unknown in the West. And yet he's been associated with the show that kickstarted fandom in America and the show that kick-started fandom in France. And so it kind of sold itself, so I'm maybe claiming too much credit, but it, it took me three weeks to sell it because Matsumoto is a very attractive option. And from there, it was all systems go. Uh, we already had talked to a number of friends about how they would contribute to it. And we put together a really, really fascinating group of people. Um, I've, I'm the general editor of the book and Darren is my co-editor. Darren essentially ran the pictorial side of it, liaising with all the authors about what pictures they wanted, um, liaising with all the various um, companies to try and help out where he could. I ran the editorial side of it. Um, We also spent quite a bit of time talking to our publisher, McFarland, about the way we hope this book will go. Uh, McFarland are a really interesting house. They're not a conventional academic publishing house. They're more of a hybrid. They do work that is very, very much respected and very important in the academic field, but they also price it at points that are affordable to the ordinary fan. Anybody that hasn't actually gone out to buy an academic book recently might be horrified to know that prices range usually from the high $75 to $100 all the way up to a $2,000 book that I saw published last year because academics have to publish university presses are endowed to publish and despite the fact that the books sell for so much nobody involved gets paid McFarland actually do pay royalties on the work so that seemed fair to because we work as a collective that seemed fair to everybody but McFarland were also willing to tell me that they would put this book out below a $50 price point so we knew that you know the average fan going to a convention will drop $50 on a box set or a figure or something they really want so we knew that that would be accessible to fans who really, really wanted this book. And that was important, I think, for everybody involved. But we, we have wonderful, wonderful contributors. We have a, a really remarkable roster of people talking about many, many things that people won't expect in an academic book. 
I mean, for instance, Tim talks in great detail and in a way that many academics would find challenging about the multiple layers of artists between Matsumoto's creation and final publication and how that, yeah, I, I just find it a revelation, Tim, to, to, to realize how that impacts the work. But we also have um, uh, cosplay teams, Enko Ako Cosplay, talking in again a way that many academics will instantly relate to, but a way every cosplayer will relate to, about the philosophical base that they take from the characters they cosplay and how they research and engage with the actual material they're cosplaying and how that informs their process. So that's something that you don't see in many academic books, but it's a really interesting way of working. Um, we have Zach Davison doing a wonderful piece about how he as a translator engages with a text. Um, we've got Edmund Hoff, uh, a young Canadian scholar, writing about the background in 70s and 80s um, fanzines and anime zines on how Matsumoto impacted the cosplay scene at the time. So we've got so many layers of remarkable stuff. Jake Tarbox, Jonathan Tarbox, who um, was one of the, the head honchos of Raijin Comics and now teaches in uh, the, the Gulf in Abu Dhabi, has done an incredible uh, examination of um, the cockpit and Senjo and on how in order to read that with understanding from a Western perspective, Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey is actually less effective than Ivan Morris's work on heroism in Japan. So we, we've, we've just got some sensational stuff topped off with a never before published interview with Matsumoto, which Darren did back in 2019. Oh, and Darren himself has approached um, the whole Wagnerian aspect of Matsumoto's work with a wonderful analysis and Stephanie Thomas has come in with an incredibly close reading of Matsumoto's female characters. So I think we've got an awful lot going on there that will be will be so worth looking at. All right, I'm already first. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, well obviously the other good thing is that the book is now being advertised. Although I, I can say to everybody, I think I can say this with some confidence, that the cover that they've put on, on there for advertising purposes is probably not going to be the final cover. This often happens with, with books. You know, the marketing team put a cover out on the initial publicity stuff. I've had it happen with several books. In fact, my original Azama Cheska cover was quite different from the one that's there now. And the brief history of manga had a totally different cover. They put it out there because they want to start generating interest in the book. But then when they actually come to, to, to select the final cover image, there are rights considerations, obviously. There are balance considerations. The designers, the text designers have their own input and it's not at all unknown for somebody who has to set the text for a book cover to turn around and say, yes, lovely illustration, but the way that we want to set this, the font we're using, the size we're using, the way we have to balance it, this illustration will work, find something else. So it's quite likely that we will have another cover image. Um, I don't know what yet but it's quite likely. But um, you can pre-order the book. And one thing that everybody I know who has any kind of book would endorse is, please, 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 if you have any interest in Matsumoto, if your school, your film school library, your local library, anyone is interested, pre-order. Mm -hmm. Because based on pre-orders, a book gets ranked for its success. For example, Amazon will, will rank a book on its pre-orders as well as its orders. And so if you could, the higher up the Amazon pecking order you open, the more exposure you get from Amazon and the better your chances are of making sales. We're not expecting to make a huge amount of money from this book, but what we are hoping is that it will do what it deserves to do, do what Matsumoto deserves. It deserves to land in every college and university and film school library because the work in there is work with which I am so proud to be associated. It's fit to stand in any college or university or film, film school library. And we hope that by doing that, it establishes Matsumoto as a force to be reckoned with in artistic creation. And so far, that's not happened in 
Britain or in the USA to the extent it should. And if we could shift that balance, I would be so happy. Okay. Uh, Tim, could you talk specifically about your, your contribution here to the book real quick? Sure. Um, I've, uh, I've translated a lot of interviews with Matsumoto over time. Um, but none of them seemed quite uh, broad enough for what Helen was requesting. Um, because they talked about a, a specific project or a specific time that he was uh, at work. Um, but I thought that one of the things that uh, didn't get enough attention was the fact that um, whereas American comics are done by very few people, Japanese manga is often a, a group effort. Um, of course, there are exceptions to that. There are some artists who, who work almost completely solo, uh, but Matsumoto is not one of them, um, or at least during the time he was at his peak. Uh, he was certainly not working solo. He always had assistance. Um, he always brought in uh, trainees and, uh, and brought them up the ladder and uh, gave them opportunities to uh, to thrive and to learn their craft under his supervision. Um, but you never see their names on his work. You only see Leiji Matsumoto or in early earlier years, Akira Matsumoto. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, once you turn into, uh, once you turn a manga into anime, there's no way a single person could drive that bus anymore. You, you need to then involve dozens and hundreds of people. And so it becomes an interpretive work. Um, because, of course, uh, in anime, you have to create a lot more art in order to tell that story. And so then a lot of people, hundreds of people at, the, at their highest, uh, need to become imitation Matsumoto's. Um, and so I thought it was worth uh, taking one chapter of the book to explore that, um, to examine uh, the trends uh, in his artwork that you can specifically identify as something an assistant would have had to do. Um, different techniques he developed probably on his own, but then um, brought somebody else in to, uh, to maintain, to uphold. Um, and then, of course, there was the uh, the interpretive aspect of converting a manga design into an anime design, and then making it animation friendly, and then capturing his aesthetic through completely different media. Um, so my chapter is not about Leiji Matsumoto as an individual per se, uh, as much as it is uh, the army of people who make up what we know as Leiji Matsumoto. Uh, and it comes out of my own experience because in the beginning when I heard that Leiji Matsumoto made Space Battleship Yamato, um, my thought was, wow, he's responsible for all of it. But the more I studied that, um, the smaller his contribution became. Um, there were assumptions I made at the beginning, oh, this must be one of his elements. Well, it turned out it was due to somebody else or this must be his character design, but it turned out to be refracted through somebody else. Um, and that doesn't take anything away from his contribution to that particular project because it was pivotal and it was vital. Um, but it was, um, it was just one example of how we make assumptions about the prevalence of one person when we only see their name attached to uh, a work. And so uh, I, I made it my job to explore that and to, uh, to give credit to those who, who all contribute to this body of work that we're all responding to. Um, and again, it doesn't take a thing away from the master himself. Uh, it takes a whole different skill set to manage uh, a group of people and to get them all onto a single uh, creative track. And he did that over and over and over. Um, I don't know how often uh, assistance will change in a given artist's uh, studio, but um, at least with Matsumoto, over time, uh, he would bring in a new assistant, train them up to a certain point, and then that assistant may go off and do something else. Mm -hmm. uh, one of his more prominent assistants was Kaoru Shintani, 
Ah, who yes. uh, contributed a lot to his World War II comics and then went off and created Area 88. Mm -hmm. And that's just one example of many. Uh, yes, cool. Yeah, I remember uh, Matsumoto uh, actually spoke. It. Apparently, Yadarin, the uh, Carlox engineer, is based directly on uh, Shintan, if I remember correctly. Uh, Could be. Yadarin is a pretty unusual looking guy. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, by that same token, I hear Dr. Sato from Yamato was based on somebody else who, uh, some other assistant of his who drank all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds cool. Yeah. Well, well we're, we're, we're close to the end of our time here. Uh, do you have any final thoughts for the people who are coming to learn about Matsumoto and or are thinking about buying the book themselves real quick? Yes, please. Don't think about buying the book. Pre-order it now. That's the only thought. <laughs> yeah, if you're uh, if you're interested in manga and anime, it goes beyond um, what's coming out today. Uh, I, I'd say you owe it to yourself to take advantage of this this huge um, resource and uh, and figure and uh, you know get a copy, read it, learn how it contributed to uh, some of what you're absorbing now and uh, also get some sense of what lies in, in store when you begin to uh, find your way backward through that, uh, that train. Actually, I suppose I should also mention that, I mean, Tim's philosophically absolutely right, that's why you should read the book, but it also has several things that you may not find anywhere else. For example, we have, as far as I know, the only listing in English of his manga and his anime that's been checked and verified by his own office. Nice. It's quite interesting. We also have a very, very thorough set of bibliographies. Everyone who contributed a chapter has given us their own bibliography and webography. We've also got a general bibliography and webography. So if, if as Tim said, you're at the start of your journey, or further on in your journey and thinking you want to know more, it's quite handy to have this book, even if you didn't touch the chapters, just to have the indices and the lists and the filmography and the bibliography. That that in itself will be a very, very useful thing. Very, very cool. Well, I really would like to thank you both for your time uh, uh, and bringing this stuff to uh, American audiences. And I, yeah, I, I've been a fan pretty much uh, about since 86 87 and everything and i've i've been dying for more i'm always wanting to learn more about matsumoto and everything so like having a book finally after all this time uh, i'm very much looking forward to it in fact i'll probably just go and jump and pre-order one right now oh, <laughs> right after this you. of course the, the other great thing would be if more people hearing about this decide to write about matsumoto in in any form whether it's online, although they'd have to work hard to, to, to touch Cosmo DNA, which is a wonderful site, but yes, writing is. about Matsumoto, writing about Matsumoto as a book, as articles, whatever, studying Matsumoto is something that should be more widely done. So uh, let's hope that many of the people that engage with the book think, hmm, I'm going to college next year, what should my thesis be? And, you know, maybe we'll see more writing on Matsumoto, which would be sensational. Actually, I'm probably going to do chapter. Why the heck did he choose to do a video about Bohemian Rhapsody? That thing's the craziest thing I've seen about in my life. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You haven't seen that one yet? No. Oh, good. I'm, 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 I'm going to show this to you. I'm going to have to send this to you. It's crazy. You got to see it. Uh, well, thank you all both very, very much for your time. Uh, oh, sorry, I, sh I should say that Bohemian Rhapsody oh. isn't actually a surprise because do you know that quite aside from his work in the fields of space, Matsumoto mm -hmm. has also probably done more manga about musicians than any other living mangaka. Okay, I'm going to have to he read He had a deal with a Japanese um, ongoing music magazine called Rekopow. And he did um, manga biographies and manga overviews of everyone from Herbert von Karajan to David Bowie. <laughs> okay, I'm, I, I gotta see this. Yeah. Somehow I must see this. I must see this. <laughs> Rekopow. Oh, so Get it. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, thank y'all both very, very much. Uh, I'm off to go edit this bad boy for the Momocon audience. And uh, yeah, I, I hope you guys uh, like how everything turns out. Um, thank y'all very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Momocon. Oh, take care, guys. Uh, okay. So long. Keep your mask on.
Yep. <laughs> you stay safe.